Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of IQAC, which is Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Central Institute of Higher Education Studies, for a very, I would call it a historical moment, and I'll try to explain why I'm not exaggerating. A couple of months back, we had got a call from MHRD, the Ministry of India, requesting all the central universities of India to establish IKS cells, center of IKS in their institutes. What IKS stands for is a pretty interesting uh, historical legacy to talk about, which somehow got obliterated because of the colonial regime. And we all know about Macaulay's minutes of education and all that, so history gets entwined there. It stands for Indian Knowledge Systems. Let me at the outset make a demarcation between Indian knowledge systems and Indian knowledge traditions. Indian knowledge system are broadly categorized into four categories, right? Uh, basically, it starts from two categories, which we call literary and non-literary. In literary categorization, it is subdivided into three categories in which we have the core Sanatama, Sanatan Dharma literature, the other dharmic tradition, and the regional, indigenous, oral, folk literature, and so on and so forth. And in non-fiction, we have arithmetic, archaeological, and everything, technology, engineering, everything which is associated in going to give you a glimpse of Indian history. They requested IQAC to start a special lecture series series where the hidden gems of Indian knowledge system could be revealed. And you can only call it coincidence that when I got this letter in December and I was talking to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, he just suggested that uh, can we start it from January's uh, a month onwards and I said yes sir I came to know that Professor Garfield is also coming and when I talked about other dharmic literature remember Buddhism and Jainism both are part of sub part of these massive corpus which is available there so of course with the permission of Honorable Vice Chancellor who happens to be the chairman of IQAC also I met Professor Garfield and as humble as he is always he did not deny but I outrightly, you know, there is this temptation to ask Professor Garfield to say something and talk about Buddhism. So I said, sir, something on Buddhism. And he said, ha, I have talked a lot about Buddhism. So let me talk something, like give me some time. Let me think about it. But suddenly after five minutes, he came up with an idea and he said, let me talk about, he has this very interesting way of shortening the names of the professors. And it sounds like a lyrical, you know, rhythmic uh, intonation when he talks about those. So he said, I'll talk about KCB. I didn't want to sound like a fool there. So I said, okay, sir, you talk about KCB. I did not know who was KCB, what he was talking about. I immediately went, Googled a little bit, and I came to know that he is going to talk about a tradition which is very, very important to understand IKS. Now, just for the students, why it is important that we get a knowledge of the system or the corpus of Indian knowledge systems? Remember, guys, Indian knowledge system, the good thing is what new education policy is looking futuristic towards now. Our university had imbibed it long back. IKS frames the structural basis of our university's curriculum. And I was pretty happy when we got a letter and we saw that actually a lot of that, what they are trying to propound now, had already been part of somehow or other directly or indirect part of our syllabus. Now, why this is important? Why new education policy 2020 in India is going to emphasize on this? Because somewhere or other, the knowledge of Indian knowledge system is associated with our culture. It's about our identity. So just imagine this, what happened? There was this 200 years gap where colonial education kind of encroached and you know it brought a kind of sense of discontinuity. Right? And suddenly, when we do not have the knowledge of that tradition now, we, our education has become very shallow. It has become disoriented. It is not channelized towards a particular path which we want it to be. To fill that gap, IKS is going to play a very important role. I consider myself very fortunate 
that we have Professor J. Garfield with us to initiate. Every month we are going to have one lecture in this series and trying to get a tradition and just to give you a vague idea about the kind of teachers and the philosophers who have kind of situated this tradition in India. It started with Kapil Kapoor, Avdesh Kumar Singh who in 2005 had published a very interesting two volume book with Advanced Study Shimla. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, IKS, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Recently, and after that, Kapila Vatsainji, we all know her contribution for this campus. She has done amazing work for uh, Indian knowledge system to sustain it, to ensure the growth of this. And then suddenly, because new education policy was implemented, Professor B. Mahadevan, who is the professor of IIM Bangalore, has now published the authoritative, which is going to be distributed from a um, uh, government's perspective, the textbook of IKS, right? So this was a little bit of why uh, for this talk, you have this subtitle of IKS Talks, which is Indian Knowledge System Special Lecture Series. Now let, let me come to, you know, sometime when we introduce the speakers, uh, certain sentences sound like cliche and banal for especially a teacher like me, where we say that the speaker does not need any introduction. And when it comes on Professor Jay Garfield, trust me, he does not need any introduction at all amongst the any anybody who ever wanted to read anything on Nagarjuna, anything about Indian philosophy, anything like before coming to this university, you know, these are very coincidental kind of moments. Uh, he, I, I don't know if he knows, in Rajasthan University where we he had a very long association and is going to talk about uh, Daya Krishna here. In Rajasthan University, it became a kind of compulsory course for all of us to do his one video course series of meanings of life, which he had launched with the teaching company. So I was one of the first students to complete this and got my certificate. Right. So it was pretty interesting. So years after when I came here and I got the name with my Honorable Vice Chancellor that Professor Jay Garfield comes here for this kind of program and all. And it suddenly it clicked me that, yeah, I, I do remember he had done an amazing course and I was part of that and all. You know, so suddenly there are sometimes I, I call it a little bit philosophically that sometimes there is this movement of the planets which brings our destinies together and they merge beautifully together. You are going to witness this merging at two levels today. One is with this background and second is the talk of his which is going to be about three great giants of Indian philosophical tradition. But let me do the honor. It's my honor to introduce to all of you Professor J. Garfield who is Doris Silbert Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Philosophy, Logic and Buddhist Studies at Smith College, USA, Visiting Professor of Buddhist Philosophy at the Harvard Divinity School, USA, Professor of Philosophy at Melbourne University, Australia, and Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at the Central Institute of Ayurvedic Studies. And everybody who is here, we know that he is also the Director of Indian Studies and India Program. So I would like to welcome some of the students who are still here here. So welcome all of you. Um, he has authored or edited over 30 books and has more than 200 articles, chapters and reviews in renowned international journals and books. One of his books is also published with our institute's university press. If I'm not wrong, the title of that book is Western Idealism and its Critics, which got published with CISTS. And one of his book is also published, is co-authored with our Honorable Vice Chancellor. If I'm not wrong, the title of that book was The Ocean of Reasoning. So it's an amazing thing to see, you know, two great scholars of that particular tradition sitting together and one of them is going to address uh, one very interesting, intriguing talk where some of the keywords, though I come from literary background, but when I heard about that other mind, I immediately could not, you know, stop myself to think about that dichotomy of the self and other which we understand in post-colonial, you know, a power politics between self and other. Though uh, he would be talking more about that, just a kind of note about the process of how we are going to go. First, Professor Garfield will be delivering his lecture, roughly of 42 45 minutes which will be followed immediately by the question answer session so that you don't forget your questions and at the end we will have vice chancellor's presidential address and with that we will wrap up today's lecture so now 
Ladies and gentlemen, with huge thunderous round of applause, please help me welcoming Professor Jay Garfield. Thank you. Honorable Vice Chancellor, venerable members of the Sangha, honored colleagues, teachers, beloved students, both Western and Tibetan, it's an enormous honor to be inaugurating this series on Indian knowledge systems. Um, I believe that because this institute follows the Nalanda tradition and because it was central to the Nalanda tradition to address all schools of thought and all philosophical systems, it is only appropriate that we talk about non-Buddhist Indian philosophical systems today. Usually when I come here, I'm talking about Western philosophy. And usually when I'm teaching in America, oh, oh no, I think she should be translating as I, as I go if possible. So I'll stop in a moment, yeah. So I believe that it is appropriate that we be addressing non-Buddhist Indian systems today. And it's a courtesy to the nation that we, where we reside to talk about the great philosophers of India. I am going to So the topic that I will be discussing today is one that has direct connections to this institute because it derives from a research program inspired by the late G.C. Pandey who for so long was associated with this institute, and by the late Daya Krishnaji, who um, after all held one of the Samvad meetings at this institute. The problem that I'll be discussing is a problem that is usually called the problem of other minds. It's not the question, are there other minds? We all know that there are other minds. It's not asking the question, do we know that there are other minds? We all know that others have minds. The question is more subtle than that. It's the question, how do we know that there are other minds? What enables us to be so confident that the friends and people around us are not cleverly designed robots? So here's what we're going to do. I will first sketch the problem. Then I will talk about Abhinava Gupta's solution to the problem and why it faces difficulties. So this takes us to classical India and Kashmiri Shaivism. Then I will be talking about Daya Krishna's solution and why I think it faces difficulties. Then we will finally turn to Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya's solution and why I think that it works beautifully. So we'll talk about how Krishna Chandra threads the needle and finds the middle path between Abhinava Gupta and Daya Krishna. That's the plan. Okay. Uh, 
How many of you, just raise your hands, have heard of Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya? Oh, I see, only the Injis have heard of him. <laughs> I find that very sad indeed, because Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya was certainly the greatest philosopher of pre independence colonial India. And it's a very sad thing that his work is not remembered now and is not studied. And I hope that what I say today will inspire you to read his work. So now we're going to address the problem of other minds. We might, it begins this way. I tell myself, I'm immediately aware of my own mind. I see it just by looking inside. There it is, I find my mind. So there's no big problem, I think, about how I know my own mind. That's just present to me right away. But I can't look inside other people's minds. I can't look at your body and see right into your mind. Well, unless I'm clairvoyant, but I promise you that I'm not. And let me ask a show of hands, how many of you are clairvoyant? No, okay, so you are all just like me. Um, you can't see other people's minds directly. So that means that if other people have minds, then either I cannot know them at all, or I know them in some way differently from the way that I know my own mind. Either I don't know them or I know them some other way, because I certainly don't know them by looking inside. But if we think about this, a mind is, is always on the subject side, not the object side. To be a mind is to be a subject. It's not to be an object. And so looking inside is the only way I could know a mind. And if I can't look inside you, it seems that I can't know your mind. And so the problem is that it appears that no matter how much I see you behave, no matter what I hear you say, I can never really know that you have a mind. Maybe I'm the only mind in the world, I think. <laughs> Hans <laughs> Do you feel the problem? You feel the problem? It's quite clever. There are two ways that this conclusion, this problematic conclusion, has been understood in Western philosophy in the 20th century. Bertrand Russell, great English philosopher, said that the problem of other minds is that it seems that we have to infer that others have minds because we can't directly perceive it. So it seems that we know by inference. But the problem is that the inference is based only on one case, on my own case. And so it seems like it's a very uncertain inference from discovering that when I behave or talk, I, uh, it's governed by a mind. It doesn't seem that I have really good evidence to think that it, that's true of anybody else. Wittgenstein, on the other hand, said the problem is more general. He thinks that the problem of other minds suggests a deeper problem, that we can have no basis at all for thinking that other people have minds, because we can't even get there by inference, let alone perception. 
He says, we can't get there by inference because the only premise that I have is that I, my own behavior is accompanied by my mind. And I know that your behavior isn't accompanied by my mind and I've never seen any other mind. So if I start with the idea that intelligent behavior is accompanied by my mind, I don't have even a premise for the inference to the conclusion that anybody else has a mind. So Wittgenstein saw this as a much deeper problem. And then he said, if the only mind I ever notice is my own, then even the idea that there are minds outside of me is unavailable to me. Because having never seen one, and having no basis for an inference to one, the concept of a mind other than my own seems not to make any sense. And these, of course, are intolerable conclusions. Neither Russell nor Wittgenstein thought that this shows that we don't know other minds, but they both thought that it showed that there's a very deep problem about how we do. The only, uh she the same you made it all. You know, you should be sure or not any gang in the cola. No chope, that would more any soon to jig. You less. Penatambo button Russell gives soon to Chiwana. Ta Jebagi Tony. Penang around the same you wanna she. Paju de la Pigi Yuris. Catching along the same you read me, you jubber the same diggy, a gunilon and ye chigur, dinner she, Paju de lions, a same you read, same de gunilanico, you jubber the chigures. Radinza. Well, Hmm. Um, so each one of these thinks that we've just got to be able to solve this problem. There has to be a solution. And this, and it's really the Wittgensteinian idea that shows up in India. When we look at Indian approaches to the problem, whether they're from Dharmakirti, Abhinava Gupta, um, Daya Krishna, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, everybody takes the Wittgensteinian approach, that the problem is to try to understand how there could be minds beyond my own. Uh <laughs> And the great insight that runs through the Indian tradition is that the key to solving this problem is to think about what happens when I speak to another person, to understand the idea of address, of me talking to you. But what, even though everybody agrees that that's the key, Abhinava Gupta, Daya Krishna, and Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya disagree very subtly, but very importantly, on how to understand that activity of address of one person speaking to another and how to understand its role in solving the problem. So when we compare these three giants of Indian philosophy, we'll be looking at their different understandings of that process. <laughs> Uh, 
Sujudigi, Pajushin, Baji, Parubuji, La Ling Long with Tony, Tinny, Ling Longinji, Yoshi, Ling Long Su, you, Paju, Paru, Tadiji, you, with Jim Zena, Dinny, Shinji, you are, Shin, the Yuna, Shin, the Lassim, you are, Tinigi Tony, Hako, Suji, Titin, and the Konasungi, the Shake, you, you rest, the Shady Young, Madame, and I was in this young, long, low young, Tadi Yoshi, Tinichin, the Jungoris. So we begin with Abhinava Gupta's approach to the solution. And there's a great picture of Abhinava Gupta. I think he looked exactly like that. Um, he must have, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have painted him that way. So I'm not going to read um, this quotation from Abhinava Gupta because it would take a very long time. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why he thinks the argument from analogy is a bad one. Um, Abhinava Gupta says this. Um, well, let me come back a little bit. He says that when we um, when we try to draw the inference to the problem to the conclusion that others have minds, we have a problem understanding how the vyapti, how the kya, could possibly be present, um, because all I have when I have evidence of a mind is that I utter words when I have a subjective experience. So the only conclusion I could possibly draw from that is that when you utter words, I have experience as well. But that doesn't solve the problem of other minds. That makes you the same as me. And so because the only instance that I have is mine, there's no argument from analogy. There's no possible inference uh, to the conclusion. So Abhinava Gupta points out that what I could know from my own case it's just that whenever there is speech and action, it's guided by, what I want to know is that it's guided by states of mind. But all I know from my case is that my own speech and action is guided by my mind. And what that means is, if that's the premise in my argument, then if I want to get to the conclusion that everybody's speech and behavior is guided by a mind, then I have to already assume the vyapti. I already have to assume, to assume what's to be proven, namely that your case is just like my case. Because if I don't already know that, I can't possibly use the evidence in my own case to say something about you. But the whole problem of other minds is this, are you just like me? To assume that you are is to assume that which is to be proven. Abhinav Gupta Hongi di Kulata uh the <laughs> Now, Abhinava has a really ingenious solution to this problem, and I will read this part. Abhinava says, the sense in which the addressor and the addressee, that is the one to whom I'm talking and me who's doing the talking, though different, though I'm different from you, are one person in the addressing, is indicative of the parampara goddess, whose characteristic is identity indifference. A very strange claim, but here's what Abhinava means. Abhinava says that the problem of other minds only arises if we presuppose that we really are other, that I really am different from you. And he argues that if we really accept that otherness and the real distinction between minds, that my mind and your mind are truly distinct, then he thinks there is no solution to the problem that we are stuck with the inability to know other minds. So his solution is to deny otherness, to propose a particular kind of identity between me and you when I talk to you. 
an identity between the one who talks and the one who hears. He argues that that identity is realized, is made real in that act of address, that when I speak to you, I create a kind of identity. Because when I do that, I recognize you as another subject to whom my speech is addressed. That is, when I speak to you, I presuppose that you're not a rock or a block of wood, but a subject just like me, and so that there is a kind of identity between us, not a difference. She other mind she same she but you know the she do gonna the moon a curriculum or you go to the gonna shame but you know wrong the shame but the tadi change it tadi you know the curious do you know any condition at the same rami rangi sim da shame sim the new culture to this did in the car tadi ni car ni you know why not the gang in the cell to your mother's or the in some corangi tablam la uh Kalisungo and Abhina Bhagupta gets something right, but he gets three things wrong. Um, so, you know, one point to Abhina Bhagupta, three points to me. Um, he's right that address, what speaking to another person, is really important in our recognition of other minds. When I speak to you, I presume that you're going to understand, and that is to presume that you have a mind. But, one, we do not, in fact, take ourselves to be identical to the people to whom we speak. That is, when I speak to you, I speak to you not because I presume that you are identical to me. I speak to you because I presume that you're different and so that I have something to say to you. Secondly, the problem of knowledge that Abhinavagupta tries to solve remains on the table because most of us do not take ourselves to be identical to the people to whom we speak. And even if we took the Shaiva theological position that we are each identical because we are each identical to Brahman, and that would give us an identity of ourselves, of our Atman, not an identity of our minds. And Abhinava Gupta tries to solve the problem of other minds, not the problem of other Atman. And so there's a confusion when he tries to talk about a deep metaphysical identity. And finally, and most importantly, while this might explain maybe how I think that you have a mind when I speak to you, it doesn't explain how we both think that somebody else has a mind. That is, it doesn't solve the problem of how I know that people to whom I'm not speaking, third persons, have minds. Um, that's in the Abinov Gupdogi, Sundong Chivaina, Anni Shingin Chikche, Yashesa Yuji, your D Kong Shagores, in a young Shingin did the Shesa Yugi, same knee, the Jidang, uh, on the Shin Kara Yona, young Jigmoji by Mdoji Kong Sungores. The Ganashi, 
सेम शिम्बजी योरे यो मरे देरे मतो आत्मा शिम्बजी योरे यो मरे दी के जो या दी गाने लेगो मरे इस रो अनि दी दुगबसला ते हो ते गाने शिन चने ते यंग मारन जो के जो शिव कबसला पे नंग ये ये आधे सुजो ल सुजो यो अच्छे पचो शेम फरो पुरुची ल के जो शिव कबसला ते मिनी Rah, ah, ngada cuci sesi juga. Pasal ni, kerja sesi di luar sini, wadah aku tu korang ni, ni, kerja ni ni sesi ni je, kerja tu tu, korang lah sesi tu tu sini aku korang. Hina yang tinggi, yang kau ni simpan di sini tu kau malas simpan di, ok, mesti sumpah, tadu je lah, mesti simpan sumpah je lah. Sula, hong di tu luar sini, wadah ni lah tu kau malas. Kerja ni, nana ni, kerana lah sesi tu kau lah, ngan ngan lah ni sesi ni, ngan itu ni sesi ni wajib. Pasal sesi ni yang je, yang di itu di lah sesi ni wajib. Hina yang tinggi, sumpah. Suruh lah yang ini misumba di, ni di semiu medi di tuh tuh amaris yang hak tuh amaris. Good. So now let's turn to Daya Krishna's solution. And there's Daya Ji, who passed away only a short time ago in 2007. Daya, I'm going to read this short passage from Daya Ji because I think it's so beautiful. I love reading his prose, and everybody should hear his voice sometimes. He writes philosophical thinking has generally been rooted in self-consciousness, as it has arisen from the reflexive activity of consciousness, Rangrik, um, which only explicates what is involved in self-consciousness. This, however, has given rise to that fundamental problem which it has not known how to solve, as one thought, or rather the thinking, has become reflexively centered in itself. It doesn't know how to think of anything else that is independent or unrelated in its essentiality. And this is Daya Krishna really posing the problem of other minds. Now, let's talk about, we don't need to translate the quotation, I think. I want to talk about what, how Daya Ji <coughs> is arguing uh, about the problem of other minds. He is identifying, and I think this is very profound, um, the fact that the problem of other minds is an instance, it's a, it's a version of a much more general problem. And that's the problem of how we know that anything exists outside of our consciousness. Because after all, the only thing immediately given to us is our own awareness, our own appearance or consciousness. Daiji is saying that if <clears throat> that we're immediately aware of our own conscious experience, we just have it and we know our conscious experience intimately and inwardly. But we can only be aware of external phenomena in a mediated way that is only through our inner experience. I know this glass because I have an immediate experience of the glass and I take my experience to give me evidence of something that lies beyond. And if that's true, he points out, then reflexive awareness, Rangrik, must be the ground of all of our other awareness. I have to first know that I am aware and then after knowing my own awareness, infer to something external. But then Diaji points out, if that's true, we would not know that our experience, we could never know that our experience relates to anything outside. And if that's true, there would be no way to know anything other than our own consciousness. So Diaji is saying that if we begin with this idea that we know our own consciousness first and only infer it to the outside world, there's no premise that allows us to infer the existence of anything. And that makes it mysterious. Not only how I know that you have a mind, but also how I know that you have a body or that there's any you at all. And so Diaji sees the problem of other minds as a very special instance of the problem of anything else. <laughs> Kangi di tablam di sungsu di zo di tanda kongi di long jie jie di ane zo di ta di other minds na shi sem shi ba dinzu yue me di ha kwea di ane jina chiru gi yu shi ba dinde gi yue me di ha kwea da yang kangi di da yang nyam do de du res pena ran zu gi sem gi re shi ba yi gi chiru du jala shi ba ngubo if um 
the Casore, Chirugi, Casore, Semingi, Chiro, do you be Mobu Kayan, Hako to be a famous very Calico Chagores, wounded under the Kongi, Casore, a long day, so did of some Gores Kong. So Diaji's solution to this is very beautiful. He says that at least some objects um, have a kind of capacity to be thought of as subjects like we do. And he says that this is because just as physical objects show that they are independent of our minds by resisting our desires. So for instance, I might want to walk through a wall, but the wall won't let me walk through it and proves to me that because it resists my desires, it exists. Um, because I want to climb to the top of a tree, but because the tree is too tall, I can't climb, so I know that it exists. He points out that other subjects, other pizza beings with minds, resist us, or that is, they assert that they are independent of us by turning away from us, by disagreeing with us. And so I come to know that other objects exist because they don't bend to my will, and that other minds exist because people disagree with me, because people um, have contrary views. And when we're using language, Diage says, we are always addressing someone, um, or we're always being addressed by someone. And when we are, it's somebody who has a different perspective. That different perspective tells us that there are other minds. And so what Daya concludes, this is a beautiful line, the inalienable and irreducible subjectivity of the other. That is the fact that the other person has to be thought of as a subject is encountered by its non-acceptance or opposition or rejection of what communicate, one communicates even after they've understood it. So it's the fact that you argue with me that shows me that you have another mind. Very beautiful argument. Mm Kong and there's something right about Dayaji's solution, and it's better than Abhinavaguptas, because Daya Krishna recognizes the difference of other minds from our own, not their sameness, and that's a very important advance. And it's also important to note that Daya Krishna sees that whole problem of other minds as a part of the much larger problem of how we know the external world. And in doing so, he's situating minds in the world in a much more natural way. So Diaji shows this in doing this, just why the problem of other minds almost undoes itself. When we pose the problem, if I try to talk to you about the problem of other minds, I'm already presupposing that you're another mind. And so there can't be a problem to solve if I'm even talking to you. But he still sees the distinctive characteristic of the problem of other minds, why it's different from the problem of other bodies. It's different because it involves different perspectives or different moments of subjectivity. Mm-hmm. 
Abina Gupta is so in a shinji yo, shin sim di yo, shin ayang. You were in a yang chick by him, but doji. Tendage the shayo is. Tanda, diaji is soon to chivina, shin yo di yang, tadira imba, raw. Tendage shayo is. The imba di was the same with objects, raw. Anim the young penanganzo, or the page kitchen pashi to the bamatin badat into some make it only. Haku yoza, the shinji yo di, uh, same with objects. But there's also something wrong with Diaji's solution, and we have to confront that. When Diaji is focusing on this situation of address, me speaking to you, he inherits a problem from Abhinavagupta. That is, he explains how we see second persons, the person to whom I'm speaking, as a subject, but not how we see third persons, not how we see others as subjects. <clears throat> so, and... In doing so, Daya asserts the absolute difference between the first person subject and other subjects. He, by acknowledging difference, he slides into saying that the only way I really know you have a mind is if you radically disagree with me, which seems a bit strong. And this raises the question of the, pro the problem of other minds in a new way. We might say, in reflecting on Daya's solution, this is a very deep problem because of the way he sees the problem of other minds as akin to the problem about the external world. And given that we represent all objects that we experience, all objects of knowledge, tables, chairs, trees, and rocks, as external to ourselves and other, why do we represent some of those as having minds and others not? And Daya Krishna, by assimilating those problems, makes it very hard to answer this question, which is yet another way of posing the problem of other minds. So if we accept his solution, the same problem reoccurs. Abinov Gupta the um, mm. So where does this leave us? There we have Abhinavagupta and Daya Krishna. Abhinavagupta would have us take the identity of me with everyone else as the basis for my knowledge of other minds. Daya Krishna wants us to take the difference between me and everybody else as the basis for knowing other minds. Each of them contributes some important insights towards the solution, but each solution fails. Tony, any a tishila sharp tony, any pajodi, or shinna, same you about same shin button to one to your race. Daya Krishna ji is soon to Chivaina, a difference, Nara, the Sujo, Susu, Dan, Pajo, Shin, Pajo, Ni, Digi, Tade, Yuba, tishila sharp tony. Tangi, Abino Gubdagi, Shin, the Randa, Shin, the Ni, Moji, in betony, Debis Tony, Shin, the Yuba Shai, the Che. Then Daya Krishna ji is soon to Chivaina. Rangde so now we turn to Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya's solution, which I think succeeds in solving this problem in a beautiful way, drawing on each of the, uh, the insights that we find in each of the others. First, let's talk a bit about the importance of language in understanding the problem of other minds. 
And this is all drawing from Krishna Chandra. The meaning of the word I, just like the meaning of any other word that we use, derives from the way we use that word conventionally. Words don't have their meanings intrinsically. They get their meaning from being used by human beings. And, but also we should note that we understand ourselves, what it is for me to understand myself, by use, knowing how to use that first person pronoun, I. When I know how to say, I am happy, I am here in Sarnat, I am giving a talk, I am a philosopher, only by learning to use that word I and to make that imputation of an identity for myself do I come to know who I am. And that is when we use the pronoun that way, we refer to ourselves not as objects, not as things outside, but as subjects, as the beings who do the talking and thinking about objects. For this reason, language is the way that our self-consciousness is understood and expressed. We only come to know who and what we are by conceptual imputation through language. That's why we can say that the person is merely an imputation, merely a linguistic construct. And language, we always use language when we address someone else. And language is understood when somebody else addresses us. That's the first set of points to keep in mind. The meaning of uh, uh Mm. <clears throat> So as we've said, we use language when we address somebody else and when, we, and when we understand things that are addressed to us. And this means that when we understand the word I, that is, when I know who I am, we can only do that by assuming that the other people to whom we speak, that is, when I talk to you, I understand the word I to be used the same way you use the word I. And so I assume when speaking to you that you are also a subject. So far, at this point, we don't see any difference between Kesi Bhattacharya and Abhinava Gupta. Each of them is noted that when I speak to a second person, I presuppose that that person could also say I, that that person is also a subject. Then the <laughs> But 
But now we turn to KCB's new idea. KCB asks a second question. What makes it possible not for me to use the word I, but for me to use the word you? What makes it possible for me to use language at all, not just the first person pronoun? And he points out that the meaning of any word is made possible by social conventions that determine how we use those words. The meaning of the word table is determined by how we use the word table. The meaning of the word tree is used by how we determined by how we use it. And the meanings of the words I and you are determined by conventions regarding those meanings. And this means that to use language at all, whether to say I, you, she, he, they, or anything, I've got to participate in social conventions. I've got to be part of a conventional world that has rules for using words. And to do that, to be participating in those conventions that make language meaningful, I have to think of myself as a member of a community that follows those conventions. Just as when I vote, I have to think of myself as a member of a nation. When I speak English, I think of myself as a member of this community of English speakers. If I speak Tibetan, I think of myself as a member of a community of Tibetan speakers. And I consciously use words in the way they are used in that community. Otherwise, I couldn't mean anything at all. And that means that I've got to be a member of a community of subjects, people who work to establish conventions, who collectively make meaning possible and make it possible for us to address one another. ディ、あの、この銀と、たんだぶとぺな、人間でないやが人間を捨てる。愛、自由と思ってこれ、ちゃ。たんだ、たこの銀たんだでなら、カルスゴルスとかの、ワンジュギ、あ、急にばでせる
function as the foundation. Third person is necessary for second person, just as second person is necessary for first person. And so, KCB concludes, I can only even ask the question, how do I know there are other minds? Or are there other minds? If I already have language, and that is already to presuppose that there are other minds. Even asking the question presupposes the answer. The uh Chidani, Ani Shem Hasure, Mishim Badzula, Sem Yure, Yu Marisia, the Tiwa, Kurang Hasure, Lebala, Ani, that Miss Homajik, Mishim Batama Yobajik, and when you know the Kelly and Guyores. So now we can ask how KCB threads the needle and finds a way between Abhinava Gupta and Daya Krishna. All three of these Indian approaches, all coming from the great knowledge systems of India, agree that the problem of other minds only appears to be a problem if we start with our own case and think that it's easy for me to know my own mind and wonder how I know others. Each of them shares the insight, the realization, that we can only know ourselves as subjects and as thinkers um, if we also know that other people are subjects and thinkers, that we can't even understand ourselves as thinkers in isolation. But if we stop here and we just say that understanding ourselves presupposes understanding others, we then don't see deeply that the problem of other minds is not just a problem about our inner experience and about whether others have inner experience, it's a problem about conventions. It's a problem about meaning. It's a problem about how we become human beings in the context of a conventional world. And only when we address it that way do we see how deep it is and how easy it is to solve it at the same time. And that's what Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya gives us. Um, that, that the, uh, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya that the Condition, Sim Shimbatunzu, you megi, Shea de, Maranzu Gangla to Shawina, and the Gangi Chagores. Conan Sumgagi, any Kandajik Sigoresna, um, Maranzu Eugenba, Ra, Maranzu Sama Susu de Casuri Chapapo in Bassin, or some Dangi in Bati, Kadijan Haku to Gurus Dugala, Mishimbatunzu Yatagana Shay, Kunzuya Chapapo, some Dangi, Yangi, Shangi in Bati. Other mind, the 
Abhinavagupta and Daya Krishna each stopped at the I U relation. And this, that's why they fail to solve the problem completely. Abhinavagupta has to posit an identity between me and you. Daya Krishna posits a radical difference between me and you. But by recognizing that we have to be different to speak to one another, but identical because we're part of the same linguistic community, Daya Krishna brings both insights to bear. Identity of community, difference of individual. And that's how he threads the needle. Mm. Ngada Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you so much, ma'am, for interpreting that. Now we'll open the floor for question answer session. So if any one of you, even if you want to ask in Tibetan, that's absolutely okay, because we have a scholar who can translate it in English. So students. Anybody who has any question? Oh, I need a translation generally. That chicken that that shensem say that the ground rawchik la in bimba ina. One one jana shensem say that that yoba shisha jerwa mi ina shensem yoba kaps samna tang derwa. Di je du that that di je du that shensem yoba mi ni kola that chik research mangpo chik trawa di di she on du. Then yam chen chen rawchik cha song. Tu che du ni diwa di karre la na. Then the Western philosopher in the Indian philosopher Karay in the Danda, Dina Roshevadi, uh Abhinavu Gupta said and the Krishna, Krishna Chandra Bat Batarjari Kranso Sum Yi, Mina, Sim Yobi Kaba Kilingi Yore Yomares, Kisi Dikilingi Yoba Yina, Mi Yimba Mi Yimbi Gumzen Kura, Sim Yoba de Mareves, Kisi Mi Yina Sim Yoba de Kilingi Mena, Mi Yimba Ganshik Sim Yoba Yoreves, did you a chikje? So uh, the gist of his question is that he's wondering if, you know, uh, we suppose that uh, if somebody is a human being, it, they obviously have a mind, right? And then uh, he's wondering, do Abhinav Gupta and Daya Krishna, do they um, accept that, uh, you know, uh, there is a person or is there a human being who doesn't have a mind? Or how does this question arise? Mm. That's a very good question. So let me clarify. Neither... Abhinavagupta, nor Daya Krishna, nor Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, nor anybody who is sane seriously thinks that other human beings don't have minds. Everybody agrees that they do. Moreover, everybody, including all of these folks, believes that we know that other people do. But they, as well as anybody who thinks hard, has to ask the question, 
how do I know? Now, if I think that there's only two real ways to know, either perception or inference, then I have a problem. It can't be perception because I can't see your mind. And it can't be inference because all I see is your behavior or hear what you say. And I don't have any entailment, any cap that takes me from whenever somebody behaves intelligently, they have a mind. The only tuck that I have is when I behave intelligently, I have a mind. So that doesn't give me the claim that when you behave intelligently, you have a mind. So the puzzle is, if I don't know it by perception, and I don't know it by inference, how do I know it? And this debate is about that question. Yes. Undi Kerang Togure, so, um, he's wondering if he understood correctly. So, even though for us to, uh, you know, know that our mind exists, we have to, like, introspect uh, internally, and that, at that time, the mind as an object, you know, and so that's what he's wondering about. Yeah. The confusion is that. Yes, when we introspect, we take our mind as an object. And that's actually part of the point. Because when we do that, when we take something as an object, we take it as an object conventionally. We take it to be something that we posit using language and using thought. And so Casey Bhattacharya is asking the question, given that we only know ourselves by positing ourselves, by imputing ourselves, what do we need in order to do that kind of conceptual imputation? And he's arguing we need language to do that. Then he's asking, what do we need for language? For language, we need linguistic conventions. What do we need for linguistic conventions? We need a community to constitute the conventions. What do we need to have a community? Other minds. And so we can only really posit our own mind if we already recognize ourselves as being a member of a community of minds. So it's a very pretty argument. Mm. 
Ki Tony, some way killed in Tuegi, call in Tuegi, Dodgy, Dembibu Gores. Ro Tinni, um, Dindegi Tony, Dindin, Dindesini, uh, Dembib Chisa Vigela, this Dindegi, some more, uh, Kowajik, Lintungi, Ro, Dindegi, Sobojik, Che, D, you do on Sobojin, Dinal Mim Mongoji, you are. Mimongoji do not miss him, but Mimotin Zulayang, send me over the Dindesin to rest here, Dindesh race. Lasso. The so he is actually asking about the nature, the sobab of the mind itself, the you know the stratum and the substratum of the mind. So he is wondering yeah. about that. That, of course, is a deep and important question, um, but it's not the question that's at issue here. And I think that's important to see. It's one thing to ask what the mind is. That's the question about the nature of mind. It's another to ask the question, how do we know that there's a mind there? And this debate is about the second question. If we were to answer the first question, that takes us back into Umala Jukpa, and we can just read that text and, <laughs> and discuss it. But um, this is the question about knowledge. And so even once I know what the nature of mind is, it's a question of how do I know that there's one there. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, this question is addressed as well, and it's famously addressed by Dharmakirti. Um, I deliberately didn't talk about Dharmakirti here because I wanted this to be a talk about other non-Buddhist Indian systems, partly because I think it's really important to, in, for us all to remember, however profound the Buddhist tradition is, there are other traditions we, with which it is in dialogue and that we should be paying attention to those as well. And because this was a lecture on Indian knowledge systems, I wanted to remind us that there are contemporary Indian philosophers as well as ancient Indian philosophers and that we should pay attention to our recent friends as well as to our old friends. But the question you raise is an important one, just not the one for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Kandijiyoru,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,ne,
uh, as in the case of uh, this very issue itself, uh, Acharya Dharmakirti himself wrote an independent text, treatise that is called Santanandar Siddhi, Kushen Rupa. And then uh, uh, Dwalha, Vinita Deva, wrote a commentary to that. And th this treatise deals elaborately about, you know, how we know that the other person has, uh, you know, the mental continuity or mental uh, uh, the, the, um, mind. And it, it is quite detailed with uh, what kind of logic you are using on that and uh, how the premises and then the analogy that we are using and what kind of pervasive, uh, you know, the factors that you are applying on them and how they can be, you know, applied perfectly or uh, without any error. So these are quite in detail, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussed in, in that text. Um, so here we have been hearing from uh, Jela about these t three uh, Indian uh, masters. One is the Abhinava Gupta, and uh, Abhinava Gupta has already, uh, you know, uh, referred to uh, Dharmakirti and responded to his ideas as well. And uh, as uh, Jela said that uh, the Abhinava Gupta's, uh, you know, uh, kind of response or idea that he proposed to, to solve this problem is, uh, you know, the, I the identity. I think that is, uh, I think the, the background from which this kind of idea, you know, emerged is based on the Brahma and uh, um, Atman and which is now, which is itself, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarded as a consciousness. So the consciousness itself is the universal consciousness, the big consciousness, the great consciousness, and dividing the individual consciousnesses. So there are some, we, if we go into details and how his, he comes to this kind of idea can be, I think, uh, you know, um, found and uh, clues can be found how he came to this conclusion. Then, uh, then we have the uh, the professor Jesse Pandey, uh, P professor Dayakrishnas. Uh, professor Dayakrishna, uh, I got the chance to you know uh, listen to him many times and participate in many of the you know uh, conferences and seminars. Very vivid, very clear, and uh, who has a very simple approach to address issues in a very sim simplistic manner. Uh, so he has uh, you know, addressed this question by bringing differences in, uh, you know, other than the uh, identical, you know, uh, the factor. And uh, but then he leaves out the third person, right? But uh, Krishna, uh, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, as uh, I have not read him, uh, but. Uh, as he has proposed that, you know, the I, you, and they are based on the, you know, convention of language and also based on the fact that we are a member of a community. So these, I think he is uh, addressing the issue differently. The question is here whether there is a community or not. Because it is not a question of whether there is, uh, you know, not only the other person, but uh, if there are other persons, then can, there can be many more persons, then only we can have community, right? If there is no other person, how can we have a community? So the question is much, much basic than what uh, uh, Krishna uh, Chandra Bhattacharya is responding. I th think that the, the question that other person, whether how, you know, the other person exists is more fundamental. And then once we have solved that, or, you know, then we can expand it to, to the community. There are, you know, third person, there are, you know, many third persons, and then community. And then on the basis of that, the language, you know, is, uh, language comes into practice. And then the, on that convention, we use that, right? So uh, I think the, the, the question, 
uh, of whether the other person has a mind or whether the other person, the mental continuum exists or not is a very fundamental question. So the, this, uh, the Chantakirti and Dharmakirti addresses that uh, there is, uh, um, I think if they, these three, all of these three addresses this, uh, you know, in the same manner, I don't know. But uh, Chantakirti, uh, Dharmakirti says that uh, when I do something, when I think something, when I do something, first I think, right? And m out of my thought, then my action comes. But then when I infer to other person, what I see is their action. And then through action, as based on my experience, I can infer that uh, because there is a, such an action, speech, so this, might, this must come out of that kind of you know, uh, thought and mind. So in the reverse manner, here I experience that uh, I have a mind, I, and because of uh, intention and uh, motivation of such uh, you know, kind, I do that, I speak like that. And now in the other case, case of other person, I hear something based on that, because that is the only accessible kind of you know, phenomena for me. So through that you know, speech, I can infer that the other person has a mind. Otherwise, he cannot, that person cannot speak like that, right? So this is through inference. Now he talks in detail. The question comes about, you know, this is a, a question that comes out in a particular context of a philosophical, you know, uh, the, the uh, philosophical uh, system. The Vijnanavada, the mind, mind only school, uh, rejects external object, right, external world. Whereas uh, South Tantrika accepts the uh, external world. And now South, South Tantrika, the, the school which, uh, you know, accepts and asserts uh, external world, uh, they think that uh, if there is no external world, then how we can know each other, how we can aspire enlightenment or liberation for others, because how you can know that there are other persons. So therefore they say that uh, if there is no external object, external world, then they cannot be other person. And, uh, and then on the basis of, uh, um, on the basis of Buddha's teachings or you know, scriptures, also you cannot accept that because these the speeches and uh, scriptures are also, um, you know, uh, they also belong to the same physical domain. So there is no way that you can understand other world. So in order to respond this uh, kind of, uh, you know, allegation, then the Chantakri, uh, Dharmakirti wrote, wrote this text. So I think that, uh, you know, uh, as uh, the, the Chandra, uh, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, uh, the community kind of uh, question is, uh, it comes, you know, only when there is a, a person, when there are a number of person, then only we can have a community. And in order to understand, one understands oneself, one knows oneself that uh, I do exist. But to, in order to infer, in order to know that uh, other person also exists, the third person also exists, there are many third persons who exist, then only we can have a community. And then based on that, we can have a convention of language and uh, other practices. So the I, the I and uh, the other person, the, to establish and to know that uh, other person's uh, uh, existence is uh, the fundamental kind of question in this context. In general, in all the philosophical schools and in you know, human knowledge system, generally, when we were learning at the learning stage, at the student stage, then we feel that uh, already exist, they exist, but there are something, there are many which are not there, that must be learned, those are the most difficult thing to be learned. But in fact, in philosophical you know, system, it is very, very difficult to you know, uh, understand how something exists. 
That is the issue throughout all the philosophical schools, how things exist. In the case of uh, Vaibhashika to Sautrantika to Vijnanavada and to Madhimika, the issue is uh, how things exist. This is the most difficult kind of question. And we should also you know, ponder upon how things exist. And then culminating to the Prasangika Madhimika, things exist conventionally to mere you know, designation. And that is the most difficult you know, part of the, uh, the, the understanding of the uh, Madhimika school. So with this, I really thank uh, Professor Jela for, um, for speaking on this issue and introducing a um, uh, in very interesting and important issue and igniting thoughts and uh, inspiring thoughts among our students and uh, faculties. These are some of the things that we should always keep pondering while even you're walking, we should have some questions in our mind that how things exist, why it ha happens and uh, what are the solutions, what are the, you know, the, what are actually those problems? And then once we are able to identify the problems, then we can, you know, uh, find some solutions to, to, to solve those problems, right? So, um, in the knowledge system, as I, I was saying in the beginning, that uh, in the knowledge system is a very vast, very profound, and very, uh, you know, and very um, comprehensive. And if we learn, there is a, many of the scholars, you know, say that uh, in order to understand the Indian knowledge system and particularly philosophical systems, if you study only one, you know, philosophical system, then you won't be able to understand the Indian philosophical school as a whole, not let alone the whole, but that particular school uh, cannot be understood in a complete and comprehensive manner. So you have, you need to know because the Indian philosophical schools evolved with through interactions and you know, uh, and 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 not only in a very specific uh, uh, era, but uh, through you know, a long process, uh, it uh, evolved through interactions, through you know, uh, and and uh, uh, through. Um, argumentations and uh, then how you reach to that level, particular level, uh, one has to go through the historical, philosophical histories, uh, how one has reached to that level. So therefore, in the knowledge system is extremely important uh, in terms of understanding the knowledge system of humanity. So with these words, I thank our IQAC uh, members and particularly uh, Dr. Mahesh Sharma for uh, organizing this talk. And uh, like this, we will keep uh, having, uh, you know, uh, organizing talks on different topics, uh, and uh, which would be certainly helpful for many of our, you know, for all, all of our faculties and students. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jela, and all of you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, now we can <clears throat> invite more questions. I could see a couple of hands from this side and that side, so yeah. Good afternoon to all. Uh, I don't know whether it will be a question or not, so please uh, lighten me on this. Uh, nor in the, uh, sir, you said that, nor in, the, nor in identical you and I, neither differentiation you and I, can understand there is other mind, but we have to understand it through the community basis uh, conventional language, where one can understand there is other mind, then how about if there is only one person, how can he understand the understand there is mind? If the, imagine only there is one person, how that, can he understand there that's, is mind? That's a very good question. I think the answer is that <clears throat> if there is only one human being, then there can be no understanding of a mind. And that's because there's no place for the concept of a mind to come from. The concept of a mind arises when we learn names and signs. That's what it means for mind to be a conventional imputation. That's what we learn from the Prasangika Madhyamaka tradition. To say that the mind is merely a conceptual imputation is to say we need concepts to have it. 
to have concepts, we need to learn language. If there's only one person, we don't get it. So I think we need to recognize, and this is something we learned from Chandrakirti, not Dharmakirti, from Chandrakirti, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that even to think requires that we have others to think with us. When we use that word samvrti or tanya, we're indicating that thinking and talking is a community event. It's something we do, not something that I do. Um, Professor Garfield, first of all, I'm really honored to have you here and um, learning so much from you today. Um, my, one of my questions I had had has already been answered, so uh, I'll just jump to my next question. So <clears throat> it's not a question, I just want an uh, elaborate uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. So how do you mean when you say that uh, the problem of other minds only appears to be a problem if we base our knowledge of other minds on our own case? Okay. How do you mean this? Okay. Thank you. That's a really good question, and it gets to the heart of what I'm talking about. If I start by thinking, I know immediately, all by myself, that I have a mind, and then I wonder how I know other people have a mind, I'm in big trouble, because there's no way to get out of that problem. Instead, what all of the people we've been talking about have said, is that we only come to know that we have minds because we already have the concept of a mind and so can recognize it in ourselves. And to have the concept of a mind is to have language for talking about minds. And to have language for talking about minds is to understand words meanings. And to understand word meanings is to already presume that we're members of a community of language learners and so to presume that there are other minds. So, in fact, it, while it might look like we start here and work our way out, it's actually true that we start out here and work our way back in. Does that help? And that lets me respond to Geshe-la, because I'm not going to let him have the last word. Um, he is right that Dharmakirti has a long treatise trying to establish the existence of other continua, other minds, and to show us how we know that. And Vinita Deva has a very sympathetic commentary. That is right, and I urge you to read them. <clears throat> I didn't talk about them in this talk, but I talk about them in the longer paper, because Abhinava Gupta responds directly to Dharmakirti, and I think that in this case, Abhinava Gupta wins. And I think that Abhinava, I don't usually say these things, but Abhinava Gupta is closer to Chandrakirti than he is to Dharmakirti. And I think that Chandrakirti is right, and I think that Abhinava Gupta is right. Because what Abhinava Gupta says, if you take Ch Dharmakirti's example, uh, an analogy, who says, I see whenever I think, whenever I talk, that it's accompanied by mind, and that I infer that whenever you talk, it's accompanied by mind then there's either a takmadup or a makyap. You get your choice. Um, if, you, if the tak is that when I speak, I have a, uh, then when I speak, it's caused by my mind, and I see you speak, then the only thing I can infer is that when you speak, it's accompanied by my mind, and that's not what I'm supposed to be inferring. But if you think that, my, that when I speak, it's accompanied by my mind, and that that implies that when you speak, that it's accompanied by your mind. The only way I can know that is if I already know that you are just like me. And I don't know that you are just like me, or there wouldn't be a problem, so then there's a makyap. So Babinava Gupta looks at Chandrakirti and says, how do you want it? You want takmadup or you want makyap, one or the other? And I think that Abhinava Gupta is absolutely right in that debate. The Dharmakirti tries to start with my own case, tries to show that there's an inference, and cannot make that inference work.
And if he had simply read Chandrakirti Dawatakpa more carefully, he would have seen why that is true. Because as Chandrakirti shows, the only way that I can possibly understand my mind is to understand it as a conventional imputation. And if it's a conventional imputation, that it's an imputation based upon collective linguistic practice. So, Geshe-la, you're right. <laughs> Dharmakirti does make that argument. Unfortunately, Abhinavagupta refutes it. I had to have the last word, even if he's not here. <laughs> I think we have one more question, do we? If Professor Garfield will allow, yeah. yeah. Um, good afternoon and with a warm regard. So um, my question is, as the whole topic is uh, concerned about mind, my question is very simple and relating to that. I was wondering that, uh, and confused that words different between mind and soul, the mind of others and souls of others, because in our language, the same, it's sometimes translated into mind and sometime into soul. So uh, I wonder what you got to say about it. Thank you. That's a, a little translation problem that we can talk about. So we usually, if I were using the word soul in English, that's going to mean something like Atman. Um, so that's going to mean something like Dak. Um, but if I'm using mind, then I'm really, in, in English, the word mind really means the continuum of mind. It means like a logun. Um, and so that's really different from having a self or a soul. We all learn in Buddhist philosophy that there's no self, but there is a mental continuum. And the word in English that refers to the mental continuum or the four nama aggregates is mind. So we're talking really about other continua, as Dharmakirti puts it, not about other selves. Does that make it clearer? Thank you. Uh, according to Buddhist philosophy, when we reach certain level of bodhisattva bhumi, then we become equipped with some sort of uh, power, uh, which is the power of knowing others' mind. Mm -hmm. But since we are not at the bodhisattva level of our realizations, but still I think we can know others' mind, uh, even though we, I can't know others' mind directly, uh, can, we, can I still know them uh, by inferring based on others' uh, feelings? No. Mm -hmm. For example, if someone is happy and asks why, and they say that uh, he is passing Sanskrit exam, and can I rationally conclusion he is happy? And if it is rational to say that, or that happy and happiness is a feeling that requires a mind, then, it is, it, uh, then isn't it rational to say that they have mind? Yes, but. So let's start with the yes and then do the but. <laughs> um, yes, it is very rational to assume that anybody who says, I passed my Sanskrit exam, I'm so happy, is either happy or lying. <laughs> he may not have passed the exam, of course. <laughs> but... Um, Yes, and so we then immediately assume that that person has a mind. That's all correct. Everybody in this debate agrees about that. Nobody in this debate is saying, I do not know that other people have minds. The question, though, is how. And what you've offered is, again, the Dharmakirti answer to how. That is, you want to say, okay, whenever I say, hooray, I passed my Sanskrit exam, then... I say that because I'm happy and I have a mind. So when he says it, he must be happy and therefore have a mind. But notice that that conclusion doesn't follow from those premises. The only thing I know is that my behavior is caused by my mind. So I could try to conclude his behavior is caused by my mind. That doesn't work, right? Or if you want me to conclude that his behavior is caused by his mind, I need another premise. I need to know that he is just like me. But that's what I'm trying to prove. So I can't assume that as part of the argument. So now I have the puzzle. How do I know it? And what Krishnachandra Bhattacharya is doing is giving us an analysis of how we can come to know that. But it's an analysis that takes us through the recognition that my concept of mind, by means of which I know that I have a mind, 
is a concept that has to apply equally to others and has to be gained through participating in, in nominal conventions. And this brings us, the reason that I love this so much, even though Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya is a non-Buddhist philosopher, he's a Vedantin philosopher, even though he's a Vedantin, he's relying exactly on the kind of analysis of concepts that we find in Dawatakpa. So I think what we have here is a genuinely prasangaka madhyamaka approach to understanding the problem of other minds as opposed to a vijnanavada approach that Dharmakirti is using. And if we think that prasangaka is a superior school to, to, to vijnanavada, we shouldn't be quoting Dharmakirti to refute Chandrakirti, should we? He said. <laughs> Does that help? Okay, that's all, or do we have any more question from the student side? Okay, uh, sir, if you'll allow me, I also have a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, I just want to locate both the philosophers, KCB, who, if I'm not wrong, passed away around 1949. He did. So he was writing when in colonial India, and he that was. too in the epicenter of Bengal, which was pretty conscious of the you know, <coughs> Renaissance. Bengalis call it the epicenter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Daya Krishna, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity, was my teacher also, mm -hmm. was writing till the recent times. Yes. So I'm just trying to understand... A, when we, uh, when you explain this, I was trying to think that is it not that these philosophers are presupposing that the communication between self and other or I and you is taking place in a very cordial, friendly manner. Yes. But in real life, real life, that may not be the case. So if there is violence involved in the linguistic communities or the mm -hmm. communities which are being framed, it's not easy for communities to be framed. Sometimes they are imposed on you. There is this threat of exclusion of certain identities from the community. Mm -hmm. I'm talking from the post-colonial perspective also. So I'm just curious if either KCB or Daya Krishna in any of the talks or books have literally talked about that. The second part of the question is about the formation of community when we talk about this, that okay, you have to belong to certain community to understand self and other. How about certain communities which we have never either registered or have never thought them about as uh, communities as such as norms go by, like Adivasis, Dalits. And how about the others, others which are created in recent world in anthropocentric era, where we talk about non-human animals, the nature, and so on and so forth. So we're just curious, because they both were aware of the colonial and post-colonial perspectives. Mm. So we're just curious if they dealt with any of these... That issues. is a gigantic and very useful question. And it would probably take me another two or three lectures to answer that one. But I'll give you the quick synopsis. And I'm going to start with um, Krishna Chandra and then talk a bit about Daiji. Um, as you, as you're, you note, Krishna Chandra was very much writing in a colonial context and was very aware of that context. One of his most famous essays and one that I recommend to everybody in this room is Swaraj in Ideas. In Ideas. A brilliant essay. Um, you can find it anthologized in our book, uh, Indian Philosophy in English from Renaissance to Independence. But there's also a special issue of the um, Indian Philosophical Quarterly devoted to it. Um, it's pretty readily available. as You can get it online as well. It's a beautiful essay in which um, KCB talks about colonial consciousness, and um, it's, it's actually heartbreakingly beautiful. Um, don't you agree, guys? It's a beautiful, all of my students read that um, when we teach um, in Indian philosophy during the colonial period. Um, so KCB was very much aware of that, and he was very much aware that he was writing in a way that was inflected both by European philosophy. He was a keen student of Kant, he was a keen student of Husserl. He was a keen student of British neo-Hegelian thought, as everybody was during that time. Um, but he was also a deep scholar of Vedanta, of yoga, of Samkhya. Um, and his work is very much a self-conscious fusion of Indian and uh, European ideas. So one thing that I want to say about Krishnachandra 
is he always saw himself as part of a global community. He read Husserl as much as he read Shankara. He read Kant as much as he read Dharmakirti. Um, and he was very, very much attuned to the idea that philosophical ideas do not belong to Germans or to Englishmen or to Indians. They belong to human beings. And it's one of the reasons I've got so much respect for Krishnachandra. Um, even when I disagree with him, um, I know that I'm in the presence of a, a brilliant cosmopolitan mind. You said in your introduction something that I guess with which I disagree, namely that there was a 200 year hiatus that marks a discontinuity in Indian thought. And I know it's customary to think that way. When I read Indian thought during the British colonial period, when I read Krishnachandra Bhattacharya, when I read Anukul Chandra Mukherjee, when I read R. D. Ranade, when I read Hiralal Haldar, when I read all of these giants of Indian philosophy, I see nothing but a beautiful continuity of the classical Sanskrit tradition now in open dialogue with the West, pushing the, the classical tradition forward and engaging critically with the European tradition. I just have too much respect and love for the Indian philosophy that happened during that period from reading it to think that there's nothing there. Um, and I really, part of why I'm talking about Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya here is that I think that too many people, not only in the West, but in India, neglect their heritage in Indian philosophy in the 19th and 20th century. And I think that's a crime. Um, I was introduced to that work by G.C. Pandey on this campus. Um, when G.C. Pandey asked me to read the work of Anukul Chandra Mukherjee, who I think is one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century, full stop. And when G.C. Pandey said, there's more there, and it's a tragedy that people are missing it, he was right. Because those people were our teacher's teachers. And the lineage that we have as contemporary scholars is a lineage that goes through those people. And I've always believed that our primary job as scholars is to repay the kindness of our teachers. And repaying the kindness of our teachers means recovering the work of their teachers sometimes. And I think that's really important. So I'm not going to disparage that work with you. Um, when I turned to Diagy, I turned to somebody whose thinking was always creative, always contrary, um, always critical, and always highly original. And Diagy thought very, very hard about the cultural context in which he was working. I know that my conversations with Diagy about colonial Indian thought showed that he thought very deeply about those folks, but also thought very deeply about the contemporary Indian context and the post-colonial context. So I would say, you know, when Diagy is talking about opposition um, in his discussion of the problem of other minds, and saying that we encounter other objects when they resist us, and we encounter other people when they disagree with us, he's recognizing that plurality. And Diagy's concept of a community was not a community of people who agree. He was a philosopher. His concept of a community was a community of people who were ready to roll up their sleeves and fight philosophically and challenge ideas and criticize ideas. And it was impossible to have a conversation with Daya that resulted in agreement. He would have thought that was a failure. Um, and I think that's really important because it teaches us that community might presuppose broad agreement about the meaning of words, but that broad agreement has to be an agreement that makes friendly disagreement possible. It has to make unfriendly disagreement possible too. But we can't disagree until we can agree about a lot. That's something that Quine pointed out, that any disagreement presupposes a broad background of agreement. I can't disagree about whether it's cold in Sarnath without agreeing with you about what cold means and about where Sarnath is. And each of these people is presupposing that even when we fight, we agree about a great deal. And sometimes the key to resolving disputes is to remind one another about how much we share and to, take, and to divert our attention from the places where we disagree. That's a long answer, but the full answer is much longer than that. 
Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I would now request our student bodies, uh, Tupten, if he's here. IQAC tend to associate more towards the student bodies. So I would request if Tupten or anybody from SWA representatives are here, please come forward. And now I would request IQAC and SWA, Student Welfare Association, to honor Professor J. Oh, Garfield sure. for immediately accepting the, my request. The and honor is all mine. <laughs> I just, so much, I'm sir. sorry that in attempting to assure quality, you brought somebody of so low quality to hear you. I was told that we have one more colleague who has joined us from Smith College, if I'm not wrong. I would also request our student body to welcome and honor one of the professors who has, yeah. Les? Yeah. That's the honoring the, com the community we all come from. Thank you so much. And finally, on behalf of IQAC, I would like to thank, a big thank to all the students that I know what you are going through after hard work, classes, your re-examination preparation and all. On one call, all of you gathered here. We promise that on behalf of IQAC, we will be organizing every month one very informal kind of talk so that students get a chance to think about very big issues which are related with our culture, identities, and they are very important to think. And I think the introduction of new education policy in India has provided us that platform right now so that if at all something good has to be incorporated, after thinking a lot about that, after picking up what is good, we can do that in our education system. So once again, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Jay Garfield. Thank you. Friends, teachers, professors who could come here, and all the students. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon in the next lecture. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs>